Hi, hi Ashir. Hi, nice to meet you. Today, we, uh, no, I will speak with a composer from Iran, from uh, no, Ashir. Please uh, uh, shortly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm um, Arsha Samsaminia. I'm from Iran. And uh, I, I started a music school in Tehran, um, like with piano playing and some Persian instruments that it was mandatory for us to play, like tar and setar. And uh, then after my graduation, I, I mean, when I received my diploma, I went to Tbilisi Conservatory in Georgia and start my uh, bachelor degree there. And um, so the, my, my friends just called me like a Marco Polo because I, uh, I just went to different um, places to study music. Then I went to Sibelius Academy. And um, after my graduation, when I received my bachelor degree, I went to Estonia and um, I studied one year there for my master's degree. And uh, during that time, I got two Erasmus scholarships uh, from UDK Berlin, University of Arts and Gothenburg University. So um, I just went to both uh, academies uh, in one year, like half semester, half semester. And then um, I just uh, accepted to the PhD program of the Aristotle University in Greece in composition. And um, yeah, I'm still in Iran because of the Corona situation. And it was two years that I, I had online lessons with my supervisor, Dimitri Papagiorgio from Greece and um, I hope for the new semester, like a third year, I can just go to again to Greece to continue my education. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Got it. Thank you very much, Ashin. Um, what is a good uh, musical composition for you? Ah, uh, <laughs> the good musical composition. You know, I'm 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 really not used to labeling a piece of music good or bad, but. Um, if we assume that I'm a jury of the competition. Yes, jury of competition. I, yes. Yeah. And my, my main focus will be definitely on the composer's ability to develop an idea and how he or she has the potential to grow and develop the piece without ruining the main idea. This is very important. Of course, other elements like instrumentation and these kind of things are important. But uh, for me, as a main criterion will be how the idea can grow uh, during the piece. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Can you give some example of uh, recent pieces which you have heard? Oh. Um, the new string quartet by Helmut Lachemann. Okay. I just heard it like a couple of days ago, and uh, I can feel that, um, you know, in parentheses, for me, there's no good or bad composer. There are experienced composer for me. For example, yes. if I compare, if I compare myself, I'm I'm 33, uh, 33 years old. If I compare myself with, for example, Helmut Lachenmann, I would not say that his music uh, is uh, like uh, the masterpiece or my music is better or worse. It doesn't matter for me. I feel that Helmut Lachenmann has this um, experience to how he can develop his idea during the piece. And this is the main thing that makes yes. for me the difference between the, let's say, good and bad composer, yes. if we want to say these yes. words. So uh, if I compare myself with the great uh, composers, I would say that I need enough experience to to write more music, to get this skill of uh, not ruining my idea and uh, continuing this continuation of the idea and growing up uh, during my piece. So that's the important thing that I find out that Helmut Lachemann is that now he is in the peak of this uh, development. Got it, got it. But uh, when, you, uh, when you speak about idea to, uh, to develop in the piece, uh, you speak more about the form of, of composition? Yeah, could be the form as well. But um, yes, how, how in the frame of the form you can develop your ideas without cutting them in the middle of the composition, for example. Because this is the main problem for composers, especially young composers, that they have great ideas and they just sprout on the paper everything, but you can see that uh, they didn't have enough uh, experience to 
develop the idea until the end of the piece. And they, let's say they ruin the idea, they damage to them um, uh, their great idea. And um, this is the main criteria really for me. And yeah. for myself, always I'm challenging with that in my compositions that um, when I have an idea, how can I develop it during the piece and until the end of the piece in, in the form. And uh, yeah, this is the main thing. And do you think you have a style? Do you have a style, your own style, musical style? You know, um, not yet, but um, for example, I cannot say that I have a signature or style, but right now I'm working on my PhD thesis, which is about how to use Persian medieval tones and tunings in contemporary music based on the one notational system called Helmholtz Ellis, which is extended by uh, the composer Mark Sabat. When I was in Udeka, Berlin, I learned from him. And he suggested, he suggested me to, to use this kind of notation for Persian music. So since late 2019, uh, I'm trying to collect a cycle of compositions, which I named the Micro Moments. This is the name of the cycle, which mm -hmm. contains 10 pieces performed by some well-known ensembles, such as Klein von Wien, Ensemble Music Fabrique, and the Stockholm Saxophone Quartet. Through aesthetic and etc. So I'm um, working on this idea that how I can fit um, this kind of notation based on harmonic series and some calculations fitted to Persian dastgah music, maqam, we call it maqam, um, ancient music. So I'm not going to compose something like a very, let's say, exotic or uh, you can always, for example, hear the Persian melodics. No, I'm, I'm definitely not uh, that kind of composers. I use the um, ancient microtonal materials of um, like ancient time of the philosophers that they suggested this uh, theory. And I am dealing with that in my contemporary thinking and my composition. Mm -hmm. So how I would apply these materials as a as material for composing new music. Of course, the materials are coming from the 13th or 12th century, but um, I think they are very new and it's possible to use them. And um, my main focus is not just right for, for example, um, it's not just for the Iranian ensembles that they are used to play microtones, but my main focus on my thesis is how other nations and other cultural backgrounds, uh, performers, they can, um, also perform these calculated micro microtones precisely. Someone from Iceland, someone from Finland, and other places in the world, they have they will have the um, ability to perform these microtones um, on their instrument, especially Western instrument, not just Persian ones. Uh, that's why I compose for well-known ensembles. I ask them to try because they are very the high level, like Music Fabric or Klein von mm Wien, -hmm. and it was very successful. I had a very nice, um, let's say, experience with them. Yeah, this is my. It's not a signature, but this is the, let's say, uh, my development from ten years ago to now. Yes, got it. So is this is like uh, okay, what you are interested in nowadays in music, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, but uh, do I correctly understand that uh, this ideas, right? You, you're looking, uh, you're looking back to to, um, to something uh, which, let's say, connected with Iranian culture, right? This is uh, right. these ideas are coming from from Iran, right? From yes. from 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 Persian philosophers in 12th century. So um, we have some old. Um, let's say references and books which was written by these philosophers polymaths like uh, Safiyeddin al-Urmavi or Farabi different names and they uh, suggested and proposed different theories on Persian tones and tunings and I tried to and you know this um, this kind of thinking and these theories are um, right now getting to an end and Persian music is getting different right now in new era because um, we had one uh, musician named Ali Nadi Vaziri in uh, like, 
hundreds and hundreds and half years ago, something like that. Um, he went to Europe. He brought some ideas from France, and he he had he was very strong um, uh, personality. He had uh, and the society and the, and let's say community of musicians, and he manifested some accidentals, new accidentals in microtones, and he tempered the Persian music in twenty four equal division of octaves. So I would say that Persian music is not temperament, mm. but this guy, mm. like a like like Bach, uh, tempered the music and Persian music. So I'm talking about before Ali Nari Good, good. good. So my materials are from before Ali Nari Vaziri, before temperament. Good, but you and are you using uh, this? I just understand you you are using some kind of conceptual ideas of that time, but are you applying those in, in, in traditional instruments or in, uh, in the Iranian or Persian instruments or it's contemporary or you merge into contemporary ideas and, and best ideas and, and best instruments, how it? Yes, as, as, I, as I just mentioned, uh, my main focus is uh, to apply them on Western instruments and uh, okay. with for the Western ensemble because um, it's possible to use this theory, of course, for Persian instruments and composing new music and contemporary music based on Persian instruments. But uh, my main focus is to to widen this idea to um, other cultures and nations. Maybe someone from another uh, country with different cultural background will be interested in using uh, Persian microtones. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to write this thesis as a reference for the different composers you know this makes music uh, more persian music more universal let's say yes um, and yeah. what mm, uh, what kind of value right uh, this uh, persian music but uh, particularly it's a concept on which you work can add to to contemporary uh, to contemporary music um, actually, the the interaction between the it is in my opinion, it's not yeah. something. I think the interaction between the intervals together, and this very precise theory that we have, the calculated tones and tunings in Persian music, is very important. And I think it's. You can use it as a sound phenomenon sometimes. When you listen to them harmonically, you will have some sound phenomena, beat frequencies, many, many interesting things coming from these theories. And I think Persian music um, is not just like a melodical and horizontal thinking. As we can see right now, Persian music is very horizontal. But when you come back, um, when you look back to like um, other centuries, like 12 or 13 centuries, you will find out that when you use these materials as a vertical harmonic lines, how much interesting sound phenomena and psychoacoustic things will happen in your music if you use them and from that time. This is the first one. And the second thing in Persian music, which is very interesting for me and I really like it, is improvisation. This mm -hmm. is the main Persian music is very based on impro improvisation. So for example, you have one scale and you have you can have three hours concert on this scale, just performing on the stage with three hours improvising without getting boring. And um, this is the thing, this um, feeling of improvisation is something that I, I try to work on it to bring on my composition yes. as a developer material it's not fully improvised but some influences from improv improvisation uh, in persian music i brought to my music yes, so you are working on an open score as well right so yes i understand that you are working on on ideas how how musicians you you, you are letting them space for improvisation in your pieces um not not completely improvisation but some places in my pieces i i um give to performer this opportunity or this moment to improvise, but not so much. Yes. Especially um, in the contrast, I'm very, very precise in writing the notes and tones with calculated sense. For example, when I write, 
for example, E flat with minus 12 cents, it should be performed like this. And I have some rules that how the performer on violoncello or on, uh, other instrument, they can perform this E flat minus 12 cents precisely. This is the main part of my um, thesis and they have uh, lots of uh, this kind of, let's say tones that they can produce with the Western instruments. So I, I compose something because I want to be faithful to the theories in the past. Right. I don't want, so that's why I write you precisely everything. And when you write everything precisely and when the performer try to be precise as much as possible, then you will hear the right theory and right uh, atmosphere that you um, get it from the ancient theory. Then you will understand some sound phenomena, some beating frequencies and lots of psychoacoustic things if, if everything will be precise. So I, I'm not kind of um, the improvised composer, let's say. So Good. I try to be. Um, and uh, what is like, uh, what's your relationship with technologies? Are you using them a lot in, in your PC uh, or in composing process? Uh, yes, I think actually I'm considering myself, of course, as an uh, acoustic composer, um, but I use electronics when I'm looking for an atmosphere or specific sound that is not applicable to acoustic instrument to produce. Even now at this stage of my composing, I use microtones with the help of softwares that are difficult for the musicians to play. You know, there are some, some tones that it's very hard for musicians or uh, to be performed on the instrument. And this is the point that I use electronics and I calculate the sounds, right frequencies, and I produce them from the speakers, you know? Got it. For example, in, in medieval era of Iranian music, we have some tones that have been suggested by philosophers, as I mentioned, and are theoretically logical, but very difficult to perform, especially with Western instruments. So electronics helped me to calculate and use these sounds in the piece to accompany the acoustic part of my composition. Most of the time I try to melt and merge these sounds together. So if you hear my composition, uh, definitely I will send you some links the compositions that is very based on this theory that I'm uh, telling. Um, you cannot define which tones are coming from the speakers and which tones are coming from the uh, viola, for example. Yes, got it. They are, very, they are very merged and melted to each other. Yes. But there are some specific intervals that it's very hard to get them in the right moment. So the performer should always find the right tone. But to avoid this um, latency, I use electronics in my works. Got it. So, so let's say, uh, is it true, right? Uh, just uh, that your music would be uh, impossible to play it on Western instruments without uh, uh, technological advancements, without electronics. Because I say, understand it's uh, that there is some 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 tones. Right, which which could be done by by player, but there are tones which and still are important in your in your system, right? And which you're trying to translate uh, here, maybe for for Western uh, instruments and from uh, Western musicians. Uh, and, and then there are parts which is impossible, right, to do. And and then it's uh, the technology plays important role. Right? Without technological advancement, this would be possible, right? So let's say some 20 years ago, it wouldn't be possible. Um, actually, um, anal uh, analyzing some tones and tunings and uh, uh, with, if we talk about 20 years ago, yeah, in the ear camp, for example, in France, there were some startups and new softwares like um, to analyze, like let's say, uh, to analyze the spectrogram, like open music, which Tristan Morai used it, mm -hmm. uh, and spectralism, spectralism school in France, they used a lot this kind of um, analyzing spectrum 
suffers, you know, yes. uh, like open music. So um, if you look back to 20 years ago or, or even more, uh, you can see that they there were some calculations by the softwares and you know, computers, not, not 60 or 70 years ago, of course, but uh, in the spectrum the school, yes, same same approach that I have today. Yes. So my music is very near to spectral music. You got it. Tristan, I and Gerald Grise and other spectral composers, they use another um, calculations of finding the right tones for the ensemble to, in, in, in order to uh, make new music. And I have same approach, but in Persian music to calculate the suggested um, scales it. by plus And what is the uh, 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 software uh, which you use the most for this reason? Um, right now, um, I'm using a patch by Mark Sabat, uh, who was my teacher in Berlin. And uh, he designed a very nice um, Max patch. It's it's like open source and everyone could download it. It's like um, a calculator of the frequencies and ratios by um, using the right accidentals, which is suggested by Helmholtz Ellis. Um, there are the persons that they, they suggest these uh, microtonal accidentals and Mark about extended uh, this idea and make it more, let's say, logical and performable for, for the instrument and Western instruments, let's say, if you want to calculate. I use this patch a lot mm -hmm. to calculate my um, everything. It's a very complete patch and I suggest to every kind of composers, microtonal composers to use this patch. Mm -hmm. It's open source. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Uh, do you um, do you think um, have you considered to uh, to to write some audio or multi sensory pieces? Um, I'm, I I have just one or two audio visual music. And I try to have this kind of, if we called it interdisciplinary composition or something like that. Um, I don't have um, lots of composition in this style, but I, I had this experience to compose something for uh, audiovisual composition. It was my, I'm not very interested in it. And I think um, there are something more that I want to do in acoustic and electronic music more Good. than it. It's not in my right, right mood. But definitely, maybe in, in, in later, I will. Uh, got it. Uh, would your music would be different, right? Would your music would be different if you would be a uh, female? Uh, <laughs> oh, very. I don't know. I never think about it, but. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, just one thing maybe changed my musical taste if I were a female composer from Iran. I'm emphasizing from Iran yeah. Yeah. because yeah. there are some limits and restrictions against, unfortunately, against um, women in Iran in arts. So in some cities, it's very hard for them to perform music uh, and uh, they cannot perform in some cities, not, not in Tehran or other great cities. And um, for example, they cannot sing. It's forbidden in Iran to sing. And also, unfortunately, the male composers are ruling more in, in academies and in Iran. If I were a female composer uh, from Iran, I, I definitely I have a very hard uh, times to spend and to learn contemporary music and to to show my music to audience to have to have this opportunity to have concerts and these kind of things uh, unfortunately this is the political situation in my country and um, i don't know it's not good uh, this is um exactly the point that i'm talking about uh, iranian female composers that they are very very talented lots of great ideas i remember when i when i was a lecturer at um, 
University of Tehran, they invite me to have a lecture for master's students of composition. And um, it was a time that I came back from Sweden and I didn't have any idea what's happening in Iran even because I, I was living for 10 and 11 years out of Iran. And then I came back and they invited me to teach as a lecturer, just in a workshop for or five days of workshop for master's students in composition. And I saw that how much great ideas came out from the female composers. I don't want to make this um, like too different to make it uh, male and female, doesn't matter for me. But um, with these limitations and restrictions, which are against Iranian musicians, female musicians, I just wondered that how much they have this potential to, to have great ideas. And I was very upset that time because unfortunately they don't have this possibility to show their music like the male composers. Yes, yes. So yeah. if I were uh, like female composer, yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it was very hard. <laughs> mm, um, Western avant-garde, right? Uh, Western avant-garde, avant-garde music, uh, at least uh, very old time, were dominated by uh, you know, by male. Yeah. Uh, can we say? <coughs> do you think there is some kind of that we can say that Western avant-garde music? Um, represent some kind of uh, masculine language it's it, or not or it's a uh, gender neutral language no no of course of course not it's just masculine because <laughs> i think uh, i'm not like a feminist composer i want to show off that i'm feminist but really uh, my top three or let's say yeah top three composers of contemporaries uh, there are women like Kaya Saria, Rebecca Sanders, Kaya Chernobyl. They're all my favorite uh, composers. And I'm, I'm, I'm against this um, idea that contemporary music and avant-garde music is very masculine. Maybe depends on politically and geographically things uh, that happens that time. But um, I, 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 I'm not sure about this. Um, let's say. I'm not really one. Um. Um, what is your process of composing? How you start and what kind of stages you are going through? Um, so most of the time, um, I just write my idea uh, verbally on a paper. Then I try to have a like graphical sketch related to the form of the piece without any tones. I just, I just write them like graphical things on the paper uh, to just find out that the sounds that I imagine in my mind, how I can shape them on the graphical one paper, for example, one A4 paper. Then I start preparing my materials, like such as tones and tunings and calculations if needed. And I try to put them together like a puzzle. So I have like uh, all my materials. I have my form, graphical form, my tones and tunings everything my instrumentation whether it is commissioned or not from the ensemble or it's my imagination i prepare everything and then i start to compose them like you're a composer and this is a good word we compose the materials like a puzzle to put and they i try to find a connection between my materials this is the process of composing for me i have how, how i can relate them how can i connect them to each other in the form and uh, like continue each other. This is the process. But mainly I start with this kind of process, verbally and uh, graphical so sketches. You, so you start with idea, right? It's very concrete idea, which you, which you write down. After that, you elaborate yes. this idea into, into graphical form, which is like visual, yes. right? But is exactly. it the visual representation in the time? So you are writing some lines, how it... Or, sometimes, or, yeah, sometimes I... I use like ruler to find uh, um, precise minutes or seconds even that from which minute I would like to have which texture or which timber of the sounds. Of course, they are just like imagination in my head, but I try to um, put them down on the paper to not forget about the idea or atmosphere that I have in my head. Yes. Yeah. 
it's the, the best way. This is something that I learned from my teacher when I was in Sibelius Academy, and it was helpful for me because I'm I'm kind of um, visual person. If I want to compose something, it would be helpful for me to to watch a movie or to see a painting or other arts. It's very important for me to get idea. Most of the time, I I find something in my mind and based on the things that i experience in movie for example and then i start to write something yeah maybe this is a good point to think more about interdisciplinary art because i'm a visual person uh, for the future yeah maybe i would be okay in that style <laughs> we will see and how your music changed in, in, in the last 10 years um actually <laughs> let's say um I was very um, uh, just, I believe that I was very um, care about, like 10 years ago, I was very care about the melodic lines to compose everything in the harmony and melodic lines and everything to show in my composition using 20th century's harmony and uh, I don't know, Webern style and, you know, Ligeti maybe. But um, after and after I feel that my notational um, graphics even changed. And this opened the new doors for me in contemporary music when my writing ch have changed even during the notation, the things that I learned from my professors in academy, from other students, from different composers that I analyze their works and scores. And I find that, that okay, actually you can also be more free in your scores. I'm talking about my bachelor when I was bachelor student. Mm -hmm. And after and after until now, the harmonic line or melodic line to, to write something very nice, melodies or something like that. Um, it's not important for me. For me, sound experiments, sound phenomena, frequencies, and uh, imitating the nature sounds is more important and interesting on this stage for me. Mm -hmm. I try, I try to. So when you listen to my music after two thousand seventeen, eighteen, eighteen, let's say. Um, after and after you can find that this this idea of writing melodic line and harmonics harmonies are fading out and i tried in my composition to make an atmosphere for the audience for example for 20 minutes i put the audience in this atmosphere and they're floating on this atmosphere i try to make something um not very storytelling like something starts and something ends and then people get excited i try to be very soft in my new compositions just give them some atmospheres to audience and very smoothly i will um, get it from them good and what do you fear as a composer the most uh, what am i fear um well, my biggest fear is that more music will go to the capitalist system than we see in 2022. Um, it's very scary that in some of the leading universities and academies, even of good universities, the intellectual direction of the students is, for instance, which recording labels they will work within in the future, or how they can change their style of music in order to be performed by a specific ensemble to be more interesting composer than their fellows. You know, these kind of things. Uh, unfortunately, you can say in um, even very good universities and academies, and I think there are the steps of going to the capitalist system. Them. And um, also, yeah, I, I know my fellow, uh, from my colleagues even, um, that they said that, okay, I will change my composition because I want to work with this ensemble. So he or she changed his musical ideas and shaped 
them in order to be performed by a specific ensemble. You censored yourself with this kind of behavior. You know, it's not good, but it's in the way of capitalism. It's the way of being celebrity in contemporary music. And this is really something that I see in different academies that they, they look at their teacher and professor and they see that, okay, my professor works with this ensemble and this ensemble, how she or he can get money and how they have different commissions. I want to be like them. Mm -hmm. So they censor themselves and they try to be like their professor. This is very scary things. This is very scary thing. This is my most fear to music go to this way. Yes, got it, got it. And uh, why you uh, why do you still compose? <laughs> um, I recently <laughs> discovered, like during these um, recent years, uh, discovered that I have a strange addiction to listening to my own music, <laughs> regardless okay. of the. Uh, so you the so you need to entertain yourself, right? <laughs> Yeah, but but really, regardless of whether the piece is good or bad, uh, I don't care about it. While my first encounter with my own music, I always ask myself in the premieres, for example, where these sounds have been in my mind, and you know how I brought them in the paper. I I'm just kind of have an addiction to this moment, that to to hear the sounds that I had in some time when I had my coffee and I was here in my room and I thought about some um, um, atmospheres and music and they I wrote, wrote them down because you know when you have 100% an idea and, and, and an atmosphere in your head when you write it down on the paper some percentage some biggest big this, this, um, percentage you, you cut you censored because you cannot think 100 person and bring it to the paper. And it's always for me very interesting to listen to my music that how I manage my mind and the ensemble and the paper, these relations and listening to my music with the first encounter and first premieres are very, very interesting for me. I, I always, um, not always, let's say during these two or three years, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not, uh, I don't, I don't feel that I'm owner of my music. I put myself um, like, like a really audience. I listen to my music as a, as an audience, not as owner of music, because many composers um, and maybe after myself, um, also myself before like two or three years ago, I was very excited about listening to my music and people say that this is my composition, this is the first premiere and I am very good composer, something like that. But uh, this has changed really. Uh, more addiction to write the music for me is just to listen to myself. It's, it seems that I feel that I, I can understand myself mentally and psychologically more when I listen to my own music. Good. So I can see that I'm in good mood or bad mood and what is happening in my mind. So that's why I'm composing music like a therapy, let's say. Yes, yes. So it's basically uh, what are you saying that uh, for you, ultimate listener of music is actually you yourself, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I try to, as a composer and artist, I compose something to be um, interesting also for the audience because I'm artist and I'm working with, uh, with ensembles and they perform in front of audience. I'm not censoring myself to write the, the interesting piece that audience like, but uh, this is not something that I'm not thinking about. Um, some percentage I'm thinking about audience, of course, but the main audience of my work is myself. Yes, yes. And do you, because I, uh, um, do you like to make compromises between you and audience? Do you have this in, internal struggles during composition? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's, I think, um, yeah, I think this is a just ordinary process of like composing and premieres. Like you compose something and 
the ensemble perform and you and audience both at the same yes. time you enjoy or hate the music. <laughs> you know? yeah. My question was about when you're just uh, creating music, right? You said that you are thinking a bit about audience, but meanwhile, you said, and it's very understandable, right? Propositions that actually the ultimate listener of your music is yourself, right? Do you have these moments when you just, uh, uh, when these, I don't know, two ideas just um, speak with itself? Okay, I would like like that, but maybe this audience will not like, or maybe I um, audience would like this, but I now this is not this I don't want. No, to no, 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 no. I'm, I, I'm, but maybe uh, from the beginning of my career and for the first compositions that I wrote, um, you know. When I was like second year of bachelor degree, uh, I had this opportunity to start working with uh, my great ensembles and well-known ensembles. But my mindset at that time was, okay, you can be contemporary composer, but you should always think about audience that they like it. So this makes me, because I was young, you know, I was 22 years old. Yes. Uh, and beginning of my career, and I saw that, okay, so ensembles are, um commissioning me and you know it's the first things that you have some something in your heart and um that time i was thinking that okay you are an iranian composer unfortunately i labeled myself and i said okay you are iranian composer you have to be interesting for europeans at that time i was in tbilisi in georgia i didn't have any idea about what's happened in in, in europe my idea and mindset completely changed when I went to Finland and then I continue my education in the culture of Europeans, of course. And then I find out that I can be 100 person myself in that time because Europeans are not uh, like uh, thinking that, okay, you are Iranian composer and um, um, they expect to you to be always Iranian. So I composed mm -hmm. something very good or any style and it was performed and getting prizes and these kind of things. And um, but that time I was thinking that okay I should compose something with the filter of audiences that they should like this composition and I censored myself that time. If you compare my first compositions, for example, I have one saxophone quartet yes. performed by one saxophone quartet in two thousand fifteen, and um, that was the composition that it was very successful composition performed by different saxophone quartets in different places. And for four years, it was in the repertoire of the Stockholm Saxophone Quartet. But this is the composition that it's not me. I cannot say that this is 100% person because yeah. I because I censored myself a lot to try to be interesting composer. And this is yeah. comes from the, from the uh, my twenties. Let's say yeah. Got it. I'm not, yeah. not regret. I'm not regret about writing uh, because okay. they have the date. They have the date. And now it's good for, for the audiences and for people who follow me, my music, to see this difference, how Arshia changed during 10 years. Yes. It's interesting. Yes. So you become, let's say, more authentic. Uh, you, you don't do any more compromises, right? As composer, you, yeah. just, you just grow as, uh, as, yeah. uh, uh, as composer in confidence in yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it. Um, now maybe uh, I will have uh, some questions, but not you as a composer, but you as a, as part of Iranian uh, new music landscape or community. How mm -hmm. how new music landscape changed during this uh, twenty two years, right? During this century. Um, it has to do with where in the world you mean the audience, for example, if you talk about the audience that changed um, in the last 25 years. Uh, for example, in my opinion, the process of changing listening behavior to modern music in, for example, a German audience is very different from an Iranian audience. In Iran, for example, Stravinsky or Ligeti, uh, Ligeti's works seems still heavy and noisy for even some serious music audiences okay for example in iran we, we have had 
the Tehran Contemporary Music Festival for about four years. And this festival, which is held once a year, has been able to be somehow uh, successful in introducing contemporary music to the wide range of the audiences um, in Iran. But in Europe, the story is something else. It's very geographically based. It's, 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 I'm, um, I'm, I'm speaking about Iran, particularly Iran. Ah, yeah, this is, this is something that, um, uh, just I mentioned uh, about Iran, that what is uh, still um, contemporary music. Uh, if you talk, did you talk about society? Music um, in society? I'm a community, or... yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, composers do uh, in, um, an art, increasing number of composers who are writing uh, contemporary music. And maybe there are some content trends, are they just uh, more multi-sensory, uh, multimedia using technology, or they are more, let's say, uh, going to west, more uh, acoustic like uh, uh, music, or say somehow merge various traditions. What are the what are the biggest changes that you have observed, right? Uh, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, let's say the huge number of immigrants from Iran to Europe to study music is a lot especially during these 10 years. Big amount of uh, Iranians, they left the country and they went to Europe. It's good. And a bad side that most of them, they are not coming back to Europe. Okay. This is the, the saddest part of this. Yes, so they are not part of, uh, of Iranian ecosystem, new music ecosystem. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, it's their choice. I cannot say that they are in the wrong or right um, thinking. I myself, I, I came back to Iran since two years ago. I, I didn't lost my connection with European contemporary scene. And because I believe that geographically, if you locate it and you live in any country, as you are a composer, you can just compose and send everything by email and they perform your work. So you're not a performer to always travel. So you can come back to your country, which they need you to have. The students that I can see here that they are thirsty about learning contemporary music mm -hmm. and there are no person to teach them. Most of them, they are dogmatic professors that the most contemporary music for them is Shostakovich. I'm not kidding. Okay. I'm not kidding. And this is a, this is a good, uh, I said this then, right? Shostakovich, it would be like, uh, for them, it's a, it, it's a good example, right? <clears throat> it's a, it's a, for them, is example of contemporary music even. Yes. And they cannot accept after Shostakovich music is music they they yes. they make laugh at this kind of composing and this is something that shaped the mind of the students in university in, yes. in iran yes yes and uh, i think students need the composers that they are learning many things from europe to transfer this knowledge to the students i think this is my goal, one of my goals. And during these two and a half years, I try to be uh, this kind of person to, to show my, uh, to let's say transfer my knowledge to the students. And I can see that how much they have the potential to be very good composer or to bring out their ideas. Yes, good. And uh, in educational institutions, right? In universities, uh, 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 there are, music programs and what kind of music are taught? Uh, it's more, let's say, Arabic music, Persian traditional music or Western music? So it depends on the department of uh, music in university. We have two departments mainly, um, which one of the departments are Persian music departments, traditional music, and another department is Western um, department of music so for example in the western department uh, western music department so they teach different instruments like i don't know french horn bassoon everything and um, also for composition um, mainly we don't have 
Persian music composition in the Persian department, but they mainly study Western um, composition method, methods and uh, uh, writing that style. But um, it's mandatory for the bachelor students, if I am not mistaken, um, for their dissertation, for the last piece that they write, they should write something sounds like very Persian based on the things that they learned from the European style, for example, mainly Russian style. I don't know why it's still Russian style is main method in universities in Iran. Um, and these, these references and these books that the teachers and professors are teaching in the universities are abundant in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. If you, if you just talk with composers in bachelor degree that what are your books that you're learning composition, for example, in Moscow Conservatoire, they will laugh at you if you say that in the University of Tehran, they are teaching these books because these books are getting to an end they were abounded in, in their country, in Russia, yes, but yes. Still, it, still they are teaching this method. And I'm very against that. I'm very against. And you know, you cannot imagine when, when I teach um, this workshop in the University of Tehran, uh, and I, when I talk about um, like electronic music or living composers, I don't know, like uh, I show some examples of Alexander Schubert, music to them and they were just like ah oh, these styles are exist in the world and how and i saw in their eyes that how much they are thirsty to learn what is something music after shostakovich you know and and this is the thing that i'm really against it to to stick on one method and to shape the student's mind all the yes, time yes. and unfortunately it's very hard to to talk about this um, problem with the very, let's say, some some dogmatic uh, professors. And how many? How many? Um, to your feeling, how many uh, contemporary music composers are uh, are living now in Iran? In Iran, or generally, how many Iranian composers we have? No, in, in Iran, uh, there is a lot of uh, Iranian uh, composers yeah. in Europe, yeah. and, and, uh, and I saw in the United States as well, right? They all over. Yeah, the world. of course. Of course. Years. And most of yeah. them is very, very that they are successful composers. And uh, uh, when I when I talk with uh, different composers, when that time when I was in the different workshops with different great composers to I had this opportunity to meet them when I when I just say that I'm from Iran they told me a lot a list of Iranian composers that they know and they always for example Beat Fula uh, in Berlin he asked me that I don't know why you have lots of Iranian composers everywhere and um, it's very interesting for them but in Iran also, of course, we have good composers that they are very updated. They are working a lot on electronic music. For example, there is one organization and festival named Tehran Electronic Music Festival. And this team, they have many composers that they are working in this festival um, as a members. And each of them, they are very, very updated and very open-minded educated in Iran, yes. but they didn't um, accept the Russian school, for example, or uh, the things that they mm -hmm. shaped their mind in the universities. They didn't accept. And by using YouTube or connection with another composers from different countries, they find the scores, they <laughs> have some online lessons and this kind of thing, and they make themselves as an updated composer. So we have not so much, but a good amount, I think. Yes, and ensembles, how many ensembles were playing contemporary music? <laughs> Near to zero. Okay. Near to zero. But um, uh, because, you know, right now, uh, uh, contemporary music, it does not make sense right now in Iran. Why, why I'm telling, why I say like this. 
definitely the impacts of new music in Middle East have a huge difference from, for example, in Scandinavia. You know what, what I'm talking exactly. In Iran, contemporary music and new music doesn't make sense to a huge amount of people because people are not used to listen to this kind of music in their daily life since decades after revolution and something like that. Because, because before revolution, we had very nice festivals which um, Stockhausen came to Iran and contemporary music scene was very updated at that time. No advertising about new music or contemporary concerts, even at the universities that I mentioned, there are some radical professor who don't like to introduce contemporary music to their students. But if talk about other countries, for example, in Soviet time, we can see the impact of music, for example, and art in the society and on their revolution, for example. Um, but in Iran, the main, the main thing is not classical music or contemporary music and new music. Doesn't make sense in this stage of my country. Yes, yes. Oh, and and that's why, um, if you look back to your previous question about, for example, about maybe audiences and how they accept the new music in Iran or how they deal with this kind of music, that's why we don't have ensembles because there are no audiences. Only right. one time, once a year, contemporary Tehran Contemporary Music Festival. And if you go to the concerts, you will not find the ordinary people there. There are professors, there are composers, there are, but when I was in Europe, in Finland especially, in the premieres, you will see ordinary people that they're attending to the concerts. It's on their daily life. They are going to jazz concerts and after that contemporary classical, every weekends they are going to somewhere to listen to some new music we don't have this in iran mm -hmm. that's why there's no contemporary based ensemble in iran because right. they cannot earn money even who they support there is no support in, in yes. contemporary music in iran everything comes from self self-paid and uh, yes you know this yeah. Uh, you said uh, that uh, uh, for Iran it doesn't make sense uh, contemporary music, classical music, and uh, but what kind of music makes sense, right? Yeah, um, let's say for the this is something that exactly I talked about um, like five six days in, in, with, with one of my uh, colleagues. The music which is very alive now in Iran is a rap music, political rap music. Political rap, okay. Underground rap, because rap music officially is forbidden in Iran, uh, but there are lots of rappers, underground rappers, that they have some political texts in their texts, like protesting things. And exactly during this recent um, happening in Iran, you can see the ages are like 20s, 30s, teenagers. They are going to protest. And most of them, they are, they are fan of the rap music and they listen to it according to the streets. And you know, the most important music style for the teenagers, for the, for the young people now, that they feel that something in their heart to do something, for example, is a rap music. Not, not a yellow rap music, uh, but really, really good and powerful text. And it makes people, these, these uh, persons to, to do something, for example. Um, yeah, I would say that in this case, classical music and contemporary music couldn't help uh, people. Uh, it's very different than uh, other countries. Maybe I, I mentioned in Soviet Union, for example, Shostakovich music did many things with the people and makes revolution. And, but this is stage in 2022. Um, young people are mostly listened to forbidden rap music, let's say. Good. 
And, and uh, you said right, there are some ensembles, but what kind of music they perform? Um, uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? <clears throat> Um, no, 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 there are like underground rap music, right? But uh, I'm sure that there are some ensembles, right? Like it was in Egypt, I, I saw there, there were ensembles. So, well, and what kind of music they perform, right? So, it, it, it's clearly they are not performing uh, contemporary music, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe they are performing, not so much performing as Western classical music, but what kind of music they perform? You know, when I'm talking about contemporary ensemble and I, when I mentioned that it's near to zero, it's exactly the, uh, the right amount of um, numbers that I mentioned, near to zero. I would say two or three ensembles in Tehran, they're existing that they, I know maybe, maybe, maybe there are more, but I know two or three ensembles that they perform young Iranian composers, living composers in Iran. Yes. One of them is, um, there's one organization which is related to Tehran in, uh, International Electronic Festival, which I um, just- um, Yes. Uh, uh, their name is Yarava. And Yarava is an organization for contemporary music and they have their own ensemble. And uh, they try to perform different um, composers, living composers works but the amount that i know is like two or three but we have a lots of classical music ensembles string quartets uh, i don't know uh, woodwinds um, ensembles that they perform uh, classical music beethoven the dorjak and i don't know the okay, classical western music right yeah, yeah 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 classical western music and also our symphony orchestra tehran symphony orchestra they have um, every month concerts and in, in their repertoire, you can find, um, of course, for half of the concert, uh, Western classical music. And the sometimes first half of the concert will be dedicated to orchestral music, which like past composers, old composers, they compose till now. I haven't seen any living contemporary composer to compose for Tehran Symphony Orchestra because they don't commission to the composers like me, for example. Mm -hmm. It's, Sanders, it's very sad that I, as an Iranian composer who, who's from Iran, I never had any commission from my country's ensemble or Tehran Symphony Orchestra, but I had lots of commissions from European orchestras, but like Poland, Serbia, and you know, some other countries. And I was, I think that why my country know that I'm I'm kind of active composer, and they know me, but they don't want to collaborate with me and and my colleagues, who they are living in Europe or or they are successful composers, and they prefer, unfortunately, to to perform the past uh, composers that they are not alive, their orchestral works, but not contemporary composers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the repertoire is, the repertoire of Terence, they are very good at the uh, orchestra, you know, uh, because imagine they are studying in not very high education, education uh, uh, universities, you know, Tehran is not very updated in, in, in the university. You cannot compare it with the University of Arts in Berlin, for example. But every single performers in Tehran Symphony Orchestra, they did their best to be a best version of themselves in the orchestra. They have very good potential. If you listen to Tehran Symphony Orchestra, you will exactly understand. I hope when you come to Iran, Definitely, uh, I will be here and uh, we will go to one of the concerts. Yes. After yes. Now you, you will feel this, you will feel this, uh, what I'm talking about, that these people are doing their best in, they, they, they use their high skill to, to perform um, classical music um, and the repertoire. And imagine how much they have the potential to, to be conducted by uh, good conductors around the world. Unfortunately, they are not coming to Iran, most of them.
but imagine I don't know uh, just just imagine if um, Daniel Barenboim come to Iran for example to conduct Tehran Symphony Orchestra or Simon Rato this interaction between uh, Iran and other countries are very few of course there are some conductors that are coming from Europe but one time in a year let's say good good yeah and maybe last question I will ask you what would be your advice is to to young composers not Iran but maybe live in any not only in Iranian ones but uh, but uh, but from all over the world Okay, um, let me tell you about my self experience of um, trying to be a composer, if you call me composer. Yes. And, um, in my opinion, being a composer has like four or five steps, what I mean. The first step is when you are a student at the university and you're trying to compose your ideas, but there are no one to perform, you cannot no one to perform your work. So maybe first level is maybe you find in the university some small ensembles or solo works and something like that to find and record your works. Second step is based on your first recordings, maybe some students, they came to you and they said that, okay, I have a recital, for example, um, for my master degree, and could you compose something for us? And do not say no to these opportunities. Accept any opportunity that you have in your academy or out of academy. Um, do not think about money for the first um, stage of, um, starting composing music because you are you're composing to to make your cv let's say or larger the second step is um, for the recital you compose for students and something the third step is ensembles like good ensembles which happened for me they came to you and they said that okay we listen to your recordings we cannot commission you, but we would like to work with you. Do not say no. This has happened for me a lot. I compose for free for many good ensembles. That's a state like, like eight years ago, seven years ago. And it made my CV. I was in very bad situation of uh, economical things when I studied. Mm -hmm. And I really needed support from ensemble, but I didn't tell them because I knew that if I tell them that, okay, give me 5,000 euros, Maybe they prefer to give this 5,000 euros to another composer than me. I didn't say no, and I start composing for them the third step. Fourth step is the good ensembles and very nice uh, orchestras. They see that, oh, okay, you work with nice, because they don't know in your CV that you, you already get your money or not. You are not writing in your CV that you received how much money. They they believe that, okay, he or she is a good composer because he works or she works with these ensembles and we can trust them and give them commission. I mean that, why I tell about this? A fifth one is you, you will be a professional composer that you, when you write everything, ensemble is just calling you to perform your work that you, are, you have a brand new work. This is the fifth step that I'm trying to be. And, I'm in the fourth step, really, because uh, based on my CV and career, ensembles are commissioning me, and I'm very happy about my stage right now. But I feel that um, because I have commissions, and you know that it's, it's the fixed ensemble that they commission you. Maybe I would like to compose for five laptops. There are no ensembles that I give them my composition. You know, so I, I kind of censored with commission my imagination because I'm always... Um, get commissioned that which instruments the ensemble has. Is it a string quartet? Okay, I will compose something for you. But right now, I, did, I don't have any time to write my own music with my own instrumentation and getting commission and money from the composition that I write my own and give it to an ensemble. This is the fifth mm -hmm. step that I really try to be. But um, 
why I tell him this? Um, because to be a composer needs time and patience. Many, many of Iranian composers, young composers, because of the situation in um, uh, art situation in Iran, they get upset that, okay, we cannot do anything and uh, we cannot earn money and they are going to be like a taxi driver or other, other or, or working in bank. There are, there are good work, uh, jobs, of, of course, I'm not against that. I mean that they have the potential to be a composer, but they choose to be another uh, person uh, with the job. They're getting upset and I always tell them, be patient. Music needs time. You should compose, you should get and catch every single opportunity that you have. And then, then after three, four years of having different composing different music, ensembles will trust you to give you money, to commission you, to see yourself in different stages. That's that's something that I can suggest to young composers. Sorry, it was long suggestion, but it was exactly things that happened for me. Sometimes I get upset, sometimes I get good energy, and I thought that okay, I should always compose and do not say no to the opportunities, even if there if there's no benefits of money for me. Yes, so thank you very much for for this interview. Thank you for inviting me.